Let us get our Bibles and turn them to Daniel chapter 6 as we prepare now to hear the Word of God. If you're able to stand, please let us stand as we read Daniel chapter 6. It is the whole chapter. But let me just read verses 25 up to verse 28. Then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, the steadfast, steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. And so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius, in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord God, for your word. And as we have read it, Lord God, may your Holy Spirit once again help us in the receiving of your word, the understanding of it in our spirit, and to meditate on it, that we may live the life by faith that you have called us to live, especially in this time and in this generation. If you call us to be the light of the world and salt of the earth, and it's uh, not only challenging but really difficult when we are when our eyes are not focused on you and we are distracted by the things that's going around but we thank you because you are faithful and even in our weakness Lord God you are indeed our shepherd who continues to strengthen us giving us Lord God what we need green pastures and still waters and you guide us in your paths of righteousness for your glory the glory of your name and so, Lord God, as we hear once again your word, do your wonderful work of changing our hearts and renewing our mind so that we may not be conformed to this world, but be transformed and prove your will, which is good and pleasing and perfect for the glory and honor of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. You may all be seated. The title for today's message is Bold Faith Will. Bold faith will. We already know what a bold faith is. We've learned that from last Sunday's message. That bold faith is a faith that will trust and obey God and will continue to do so even though, even though no one else will. It is a faith that will continue to trust and obey God even though it may mean harm, even physical harm, even physical death. And listen, you have this faith if you truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I, we just have to live by it and act it out. And this is what we have seen and learned last Sunday in the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those three Hebrew boys that were captured and exiled to Babylon. And they were threatened to be thrown into the fiery furnace if they refuse to bow down and worship the image of King Nebuchadnezzar. Today, we will continue to see and learn what a bold faith will do to us, in us, for our good and for the glory of God. Our message this morning is not necessarily a continuation of last Sunday's message, but if you haven't listened to that message, though, I would encourage you to do so, and you can access, this to access it on the Heart of Worship YouTube channel but again this title well the title of last message last sunday was but even if and if you remember it's a story of this shadrach Meshach, and abednego who demonstrated a bold and enduring faith that made them continue to trust and obey god and serve god and worship god even if that meant it would cost them 
their very lives. And this is the kind of faith that God gave us. And with this faith, we need to rise and stand up for Jesus and live our lives in His truth and His righteousness. Listen, church, if you haven't noticed yet, we are living in a time where truth is marginalized, righteousness is openly and blatantly rejected, and those who dare speak up and stand up for truth and righteousness are either excoriated, berated, angrily criticized and punished, or mocked and attacked, canceled and even criminalized. And I'm not even talking about the treatment of biblical Christians. I'm just referring to the present state of affairs in the society. As you can see in the political arena. Those people in their leftist mindset, their Marxist culture, especially in the political scenario and what the left is doing to the right because of their hatred with the right and their stand for truth and righteousness and freedom. If this is what we see and hear in the media about what the left does to the right, can you imagine the scenario when biblical Christians with both faith rise and stand up for God's truth and His righteousness that is totally opposite and opposed to this world and the ways of this world. Church, we might see a persecution that we have not seen here in the USA, but surely have been going on and are being experienced by believers and followers of Christ in a communist country, in communist countries and Muslim countries. A persecution in the likes of what the early Christians of the early church have experienced where believers of Jesus were not only mocked, but persecuted and even tortured to death, martyred for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that living as a Christian in those days were a risk itself. Many so-called American Christians are afraid of that. I don't mean to sound... So demeaning, but many so-called Christians, American Christians, are even afraid of a virus. Thinking that they are not only susceptible to harm, but it's a mindset that forgets that there is God and that God loves them and God cares for them and God is in control. I mean, if we are afraid of a virus, how much more a persecution when it means tortured, being tortured to death? Many so-called American Christians are afraid of that persecution, being tortured to death. Many think that it will not happen to them that God would not allow them to go through tribulations. That's an amazing thought to me. American Christians don't think that they will go through tribulation or even persecution. When so many other Christians right now are going through persecution in the communist and Muslim countries, even being imprisoned and killed for their faith in Christ. I believe, for the most part, many so-called Christians or American Christians have been indoctrinated by the American gospel where the individual is center and the improvement of self and the betterment of self and the fulfillment of desire is priority. A gospel where God and faith in God is presented to people as the avenue or the way to achieve and acquire such a desired condition and preferred status in life, prosperity, success, and wealth, health. So that the idea of sacrifice or surrender, especially the idea of denying self and, denying and dying to self, is not only rejected but perhaps even despised. And anyone who espouses and even preaches the true gospel and even give a message of self-denial and dying to self, which is what the Lord himself have taught in his word, 
so that we can truly follow Jesus and live in His righteousness, will be marked and mocked, persecuted, perhaps even canceled. That kind of an atmosphere can be intimidating to us believers. Honestly, many if not all of us probably are afraid of that and don't want that and understandably so. But remember, that is part of God's calling for us as believers and followers of Christ. Yes, it can be fearful. And it's only natural to fear. But again, we do not have to be controlled by our emotion of fear. As God has given us His word, His promise. And He commanded us not to be afraid. He promised He will be with us and He will never leave us nor forsake us. And He has given us the hope of eternal life, the hope of heaven, the hope of seeing Jesus and being with Him, being with God forever in heaven. He gave us the assurance that through, He gave us the assurance through the indwelling Holy Spirit that we belong to Him because He redeemed us. He purchased us. Our salvation with His own precious and sinless blood. And because of what He said, we are His. We don't belong to this world anymore, though we are still in this world. But we are just passing through. On our way to our home in heaven to be with our Savior and our Lord Jesus. So let us not be intimidated by this world or be attracted to the passing temporary world, not to love the world nor anything the world offers. Definitely not to conform to this world or follow the ways of this world. Remember, this world is not our home. And everything who loves this world, as the Bible says in John chapter, James chapter 4, becomes an enemy of God. But we find ourselves in this world, we are in this world because God wants to use us to tell others about Jesus, the only begotten Son of God that was given to this sinful world so that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We are here to tell people that Jesus is the only way, the truth and the life and that no one comes to the Father except through Him. And that message alone will cause many, yes, to believe in Christ but it will also cause many to reject Jesus and not only Jesus, but to reject even criticize, if not attack and persecute the messenger or messengers of Christ. How much more when we, biblical Christians, stand up for God's truth and His righteousness. But we should not let the prospect of rejection and possibility of persecution intimidate us or stop us from standing up for Jesus and living for Jesus and proclaiming His Word. Remember, this world is in darkness. It is darkness. And people without Christ are living in darkness. But we Christians are called to be light of the world and to let our light so shine before people men so that they may see our good works and glorify God who is in heaven we are called to be the salt of the earth to put taste in this tasteless culture and to act as preservative to the decaying culture and society and even bring healing to its sickness by the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ yes us it is us true believers and followers of Christ and no one else. If not us, then who? And if it, not, if it not now, then when? God has placed us as people in this generation, for this generation and for, for, us, for such a time as this. But for us to be able to be the people of God called us to be and to do what our Lord Jesus called us to do, we need faith and to act in faith and again we have this faith because God gave it to us and what kind of faith a bold faith so let us exercise it and live by it and grow in it and even prosper in it and that's what we have learned last Sunday from Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego these three Hebrew boys we've also learned that they were friends with Daniel and so today we will learn from Daniel's life about this bold faith that made him consistent in his godly character, in his integrity, in his faithfulness to the Lord. 
that practically resulted to the prosperity and success in his life and brought glory and honor to God. So now let's go to Daniel, Daniel chapter 6. And by this time, Daniel is an older man. In chapter 1, if you remember, he along with his friends and with many other young Israelites were captured and taken from their homeland Israel and brought as exiles to Babylon and some of them to be trained to personally serve, to serve the king who at the time was King Nebuchadnezzar. From, but from chapter 1 to chapter 6, many years have passed. Decades have come and gone along with them, the kings and their kingdoms. So from King Nebuchadnezzar and the great Babylonian kingdom, which is in chapters 1 to 4, to King Belshazzar, his son in chapter 5, and then to King Darius, some might say Darius. Uh, it sounds funny, Darius, uh, King Darius. King Darius of the Middle Persian Kingdom, which is in chapter 6. But listen, here's a point here that even in the first six chapters of this book of Daniel, we see an important truth and reality that kings and kingdoms, they rise and they fall. Nations, they come to existence and they go, some even to extinction, like the Mayan. They all, they will all pass away. We see that even in the Old Testament records, the nation and the kingdom of the Egyptians, and then remember the Hittites, the Jebusites, Jebusites, and the Assyrians. And then came the Babylonians, and after them, the Medo Persians. Then came the Greeks and the Romans. And even in our modern times, you remember in history, the British Empire. Then came France, and then Italy. German, even Japan tried to dominate. And now the United States of America, which may be on the edge. You don't want that idea, do we? That I, the America, just like Roman and all these kings and kingdoms, they all pass away. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But the only one who will remain is the Lord Jesus Christ who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and His kingdom will never end, for He shall reign forever and ever. But the nations, according to Acts 17, 26, that it is God who determines the times set for them and even the places where they should live. In other words, nations are bound by the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign and He is in control. And what Whatever happens to nations and their kingdoms is all in the predetermined will of God. And what happens to nations and events of this world is really inconsequential, meaning not really significant to the plan and the will of God and is working in the lives of His people. The world and its affairs does not affect God's plan and purpose at all. This fact should encourage us, church, because no matter what happens to the world, even in this United States of America, even what's going on now, has really little to do with what God is doing with us, His people, and His children. God and His goodness, remember, God, His good plan, His perfect will, is not dependent on man nor what man does. Just like what the song says, all the best and worst of man can change God's plan because it is God's and God's alone. And this is what we see in Daniel's life from his teen years being brought to Babylon as exile and went through the rule and reign of two kings, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar of Babylon. And then Babylon fell and great was its fall and it was replaced by the middle persia kingdom ruled by king darius or cyrus and so in chapter 6 we see daniel perhaps in his 80s still there living for god being used of god and even being prospered by god 
In other words, Daniel was not only surviving, but thriving, flourishing, prospering, even in his later years, even in the conditions around him. Again, this is to remind us that even in the account of Daniel's life, that the goodness of God and our prospering in life is not dependent and not hindered by the conditions or situations of our lives. Definitely not dependent on the systems of society, nor the government or styles of government, but dependent on God alone. God who is faithful, whose mercies are new every morning. In God who is abounding in grace. In God who is good all the time. God's favor, that is God's grace, is not even dependent on who sits on the government authority, but who sits on the throne of your heart. And that's why we need faith, to possess this faith by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts and with all our hearts. In Christ Jesus, God has given us faith, but more than having or possessing faith, we need to exercise faith so that we will grow strong, bold, faithful, firm, enduring, that is persevering and even prospering. We need to live out or work out or simply act in faith because every time we do our faith grows our trust our confidence in the lord in his word is being built up built on the strong and solid foundation of jesus christ and his word that is the solid rock this is the practice in of daniel's life living by faith a bold faith and because of his faith, we will see in Daniel a consistent godly character, unquestionable integrity, undeniable faithfulness to God, and even prosperity in living. Listen, it is by faith and living by faith that we can have consistent or consistency in godly character, have a moral integrity and faithfulness to the Lord that results to prosperity and success in life. Another point to notice with Daniel is the fact that age is not an issue either. Because I've mentioned earlier, Daniel in chapter 6 is now in his later years. How old are you? I always joke about my age. I'm already 55, then that's the limit. And I'm beginning to feel the limit in my physical body. But that is just a joke. Because I know that no matter how old we get, God is not, you know, God is not uh, impotent. He is omnipotent in and through us. So this is again to remind us not to put our hope or to put our trust or hope in anything or anyone else but in God alone for it is He who can and will prosper us in life even in material abundance as He wills. It is God who enables us to do so and let us not forget as Deuteronomy Chapter 8, 18 says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. And again, the principle, prosperity and success in life is not dependent on whether conditions or situations in life are favorable or not, whether people around you are good or bad, not dependent on any form of government either. And I keep saying this, very important principle because as we enter this new year 2021, many realize that things were not necessarily good, not even better as we hoped for. As many things like this COVID situation is still here. And it appears that it's mutating to the concern of many and creates more anxieties because of the uncertainties. And because of the uncertainties, there's the tendency to think that the goodness of God in life and prosperity in life is now hindered because it's dependent on the conditions and situations of life. Not at all. And that's what we see again in Daniel chapter 6. We see Daniel in his later years still living by faith and demonstrating consistent godly character, living in integrity, faithful to God, and still prospering in life. And I'm sure we want that. So let us learn from Daniel's life. How can we be like him and live like him? That is living with faith in God boldly. 
Let us see what bold faith in action looks like and discover and learn what bold faith will do. I was tempted to read the whole chapter, but we'll go through it as we go along. And one thing that we will notice first about bold faith in relation to Daniel is that it enabled him to distinguish himself. In chapter 6, verse 1 to 3, look at, it says there, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these, three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Notice in verse 3, it says that Daniel distinguished himself. This is what faith, bold faith will do. It will help you distinguish yourself. To be distinguished means to be different from others, to be distinct, prominent, or to stand out. In verses 1 and 2, we see the structure of government. King Darius set over the kingdom 120 satraps and over these three governors so that the king would not suffer loss. The implication is probably loss of revenue or income by taxes or perhaps even territories, obviously because of the corruption of some leaders within the government. But in verse 3, as we have read, it says Daniel distinguished himself because it says there he had an excellent spirit. That is to say he had an exceptional qualities. To name a few, he had wisdom from God to make practical counsel that benefited those who were in authority above him. He had the ability to face and overcome distinct challenges. He also was able to interpret dreams as the Lord enabled him, for he sought the Lord because he had faith in God. Listen, bold faith. He had faith in God. What kind of faith? Bold faith. So much so that he was not afraid to be different from the rest of those who are in government, who are corrupt and were willing to do what was wrong for personal gain. Daniel was different. In other words, Daniel set himself apart. By having a good attitude in the workplace, he was not a complainer. And he had a good work ethics. He did things honestly. And he did what he was supposed to do excellently. He did what he was doing with excellence and with good attitude because he knew his God. He knew who he was. And he trusted in the Lord in where he was and in what he was doing. In other words, his faith dominated or his faith in God dominated his work. His good attitude and excellent work ethics was the result of his faith in God. So that he did things to honor God, not necessarily man. And that requires boldness of faith. When you have faith that is bold faith in God, you will live for God and do things excellently as unto the Lord and not for men. You will be distinct and you will be marked with greatness so that if you are a student you have good study habits you are diligent and you study well and do school work excellently not necessarily perfectly but you give your best as unto the lord if you are an employee you go to work on time you work hard you are not a complainer and you do your work excellently as unto the lord you have good attitude and display good attitude with your co-workers you distinguish yourself because you do things as unto the Lord. As Colossians chapter 3 verse 23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for man. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 31, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 
When you live your faith boldly, you will not be intimidated by people and what they might say or do. Instead, you will do what is good and right in God's eyes. And when you do, God will reward you or promote you as Colossians chapter 3, 23, 24 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working to the Lord or for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Daniel distinguished, Daniel was distinguished because he had an excellent spirit. He was also distinguished because he had integrity. His bold faith made him live with integrity. Look at verse 4 back in Daniel chapter 6. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charges against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could not. They could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor there was any error or fault found in him. Daniel had integrity. Integrity is having good character. He's honest, moral, upright, righteous, virtuous, whether in private or in public. In one simple word, Daniel distinguished himself by being good. Listen, your faith, when your faith is bold, you will be good. And when you are good, you will do good. And you will be good and do good when you are fearless in your faith. In other words, you are more concerned to please God than man so that your goodness is not dependent on what people might say or do to you, but in God who you trust and love and want to honor. If this is true with you and me, we will demonstrate integrity, honesty, not only in public, but even in privacy, when no one else is around or even looking around but God. This is what Daniel demonstrated. And this is significant to note with Daniel because of the type of job he had in public office, especially the position he held a position that was very susceptible or vulnerable to all kinds of corruption and dishonesty, a place of power where temptations are strong, very strong. But in verse 4, as we have read, it says, they could not find any wrongdoing with him, for he was faithful. In other words, he had integrity. What he was in public is what he was in private. What he was in the boardroom is what he was in his bedroom. How he is far from a distance is how he is near. That's a man of integrity. He was consistent in his faith. Therefore, he was consistent in his character, even though the world around him was changing. Daniel consistently displayed good character and good moral conduct. No wonder King Darius planned to set him over the whole kingdom. He was going to be promoted as second in command. And you would think that everyone would appreciate such a person and emulate such a person and love the company of one who is faithful and one who had integrity, honest. But such is not the case. As a matter of fact, if you read verse 3 and 4 again, you will see how the governors and satraps tried to find something to charge against him. They had the idea of him, I mean they hated the idea of him being second in command for all, over all the kingdom. They, they despised the idea, therefore they despised Daniel. Listen, when you live with both faith, that is boldness to do what is right and do what is good, you will distinguish yourself. You, you will be different from those who do what is bad and wrong. But you need to understand that along with being distinguished, you will also be despised, even rejected. And that is what they did with Daniel. They hated him. So much so they, they tried to find something, anything that will disqualify him from office. But they could not find anything because there was no Twitter at the time. Mm -hmm. 
Daniel didn't say anything wrong. He didn't do anything wrong or illegal. He was honest, truthful, hardworking, not corrupt. He was good and did good even in the day-to-day -day mundane affairs, both in public and even in private. And since they could not find anything wrong to accuse him with, they made up something, a, plan, a plot to get rid of him. Sounds familiar. Why? Why would they do such a thing to Daniel? Because of their hatred. And at the core of their hatred is jealousy, envy. Because Daniel was about to be their superior, one that would govern over them, their president. And perhaps they were also driven by fear, fear that they will be, be exposed of their dishonest, dishonesty and corruption. And so they determined to get Daniel out of the picture. But listen, they could not find anything, so much so that they got more angry and their hatred grew. Because listen, listen, envy always hates the distinction or greatness it cannot achieve. Listen, if you're going to demonstrate faith that is bold so that you distinguish yourself and be good and do good and do right in your school or in your workplace so that you are promoted and begin to stand out, in other words, be distinct and marked with greatness, be aware that there will be people around you who will target you, criticize you, persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you, and perhaps even cancel you altogether because of their envy and even fear of their wrong being exposed. But verse 5 continues. It says, These men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Since they could not find anything in the existing laws to bring Daniel down and get rid of him, they made a plot and came up with something. Can you believe these people? Look at verse 6 to 8 uh, to 9. It says, So these governors and the satraps thronged before the king and said to, thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom and the administration and satraps the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make him and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you O king shall be cast into the lions or the den of lions now O king establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians which does not alter They, so they made up, it's a made up thing and it's a lie because not all governors were in the planning and agreed with the plan. Daniel was not with them. It was just a lie. But Darius, King Darius, loved the idea. The idea that he will be a god for at least 30 days and people will pray to him. And so in verse 9 it says there, Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. These haters or these envious people believe they were doing the right thing because that's what hatred or fear and envy does. It blinds people to the truth. They believe their own lies. They deny even the reality of one's own true condition and it wants to ruin, if not destroy, whom they hate and are jealous of. How can they hate Daniel who was good and even seek to get rid of him? Well, let me ask you, how can they hate Jesus and crucify him? Even though he didn't do anything wrong, said nothing wrong, committed no sin, and did only what is good and right. Yet they despised him, rejected him, because as the Bible said, they were jealous of him. And so it was with Daniel and will be with any of us when we live with bold faith so that we distinguish ourselves and live with integrity and excellency and do what is good and stand for what is right in God's eyes. Listen, we will be despised. But listen, bold faith will enable us to persevere and endure. That's what bold faith will do. The reason is because of the habit or discipline of both faith 
produces. Look at verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, which is the place of worship for them, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Notice that, custom, meaning it was, there was a habit, a practice in his life. Daniel had this discipline of prayer, a good and consistent and may I say necessary habit or practice of praying. If we are going to be able to wield the shield boldly, the shield of faith in public and make a bold stand for God, that kind of faith must be welded or forged in the private times of sitting or kneeling before the Lord in prayer. We must have that discipline. We must form and develop the necessary habit of praying regularly so that it becomes our practice. A regular meaning a daily yet necessary spiritual exercise or routine. Prayer, devotion with God. We cannot grow, certainly not grow strong, apart from or without the practice or discipline of sitting or kneeling before the Lord in prayer. And here is the key in Daniel's bold faith. It is constantly and consistently being connected with God in prayer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5.17 tells us to pray without ceasing. Remember, Prayer does not mean only us talking with God, but also God talking with us in our spirit. Prayer is a time of both communication and communi communion with God. Constantly, consistently abiding in Him and He in us. Because apart from God, remember, we can do nothing. As Jesus said in John chapter 15 verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And this is why Daniel was bold enough to distinguish himself and live in integrity, remain faithful and endure, even though he was despised by his peers. Despised not merely because he was prayerful or godly, but because he did not compromise his faith in God. How so? Listen. God, I mean, Daniel did not stop praying to his God, even though there was a law against it. He demonstrated bold faith. In demonstrating such a bold faith, Daniel, Daniel was really saying, in effect, that his God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, was the only true and living God, the only one who is worthy of worship and to pray to. And listen, if there is anything that will tick off even the most religious of any religion is when a true believer like you and me lovingly but boldly declares the truth such as Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except through Him. Oh, they can handle the, the part that says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. By they, but they cannot handle the part that says, no one comes to the Father except through Him. Daniel was despised. But Daniel persevered and he endured because he had faith that was forged in times of prayer. And because he had, a dis he had this discipline, a good habit of constant and consistent time of prayer before the Lord. He was so consistent in prayer that his detractors or his haters knew that is what he was going to do. And that is why they designed this law and made up this law that way. Look at verse 11 to 15. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to, king, to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or man except you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, 
which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you. Then that is a lie. Daniel is not the one who does not pay to king, attention to King Darius. Or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. And when king heard this, he was greatly distressed because he realized that these guys, these people, and their, their plot was really just to get rid of Daniel. But King Darius loved Daniel. And so when King Darius realized this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Because when a person is found guilty, violating the law, they are to experience the punishment the same day that it was committed. Then the men went as a group to the king and said to him, Remember, O king, that according to the way or to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. Note on verse 13, though, they said that Daniel still prays three times a day. That is what you call consistency. In other words, what he did when he was young, he still does even now that he is old. He developed a good and consistent habit of discipline, of prayer, and made, that made his faith bold. Listen, if you want to have a good practice, a spiritual exercise, begin now. Develop it even especially while you're still young. But it's not too late when you are old. And so it made his faith bold. But listen, it got him into trouble. Yet it was trouble that gave Daniel the opportunity to show who his God was, who he was, and what he had. Remember, trouble plays an important role in our spiritual growth and the building of our faith. Remember, listen, God allows us to go through troubles, go through a crisis, because in those times, faith has an opportunity to be exercised and grow in strength and even show the power and the reality of who God is in our lives and demonstrate the integrity and character of our faith. And that is what we see in Daniel. His God and his faith in God and his character was displayed in the time of trouble or crisis. No, trouble does not produce character, not at all. But listen, troubles, they don't produce character or faith, but trouble reveals character and faith. It shows who we really are and what we believe. It reveals what's inside of us. When life squeezes you, what comes out of you? For Daniel, it was a bold faith which was a product of constant and consistent time with God in prayer. And so, from verse 16 to 18, we read, So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. You notice that? The one whom you serve continually, Daniel never stopped. And there was nothing in his life that stopped him. Not even the, the, the risk of dying stopped him from serving God. Is there anything that stops you from serving God today in this situation and in our condition? And so the king said to Daniel, May your God who you serve continually rescue you. And a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the, of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. Very interesting. <laughs> we know the outcome. I mean, Daniel wasn't harmed. The, the lions didn't eat him. The lions could eat him, but, I mean, the lions wanted to eat him, but they could not. The king could eat, but he would not. He could not even sleep because of his concern with Daniel. But then it continues. 
But before that, a Daniel. Remember, Daniel had both faith, so much so that when he was threatened by a law to be thrown into the lion's den by praying to his God, he did not give in to fear by compromising his faith just to preserve his life. He loved God and was willing to die for his faith than to live in compromise. Daniel knew his God and believed his God, that his God was the true and living God who rules, who is in control, and who is able to deliver, that his God is a mighty God who is able to save. And Daniel had faith that God will protect him and even deliver him from the lions. But even if God did not, Daniel believed that God's plan and God's will is good. God's, I mean, Daniel's faith in God was firm. It was steadfast, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because listen, their faith in God was not dependent on the outcome, meaning what God can do for them. But their faith was dependent on the greatness of who God is. That God is omnipotent God. He is the Lord God Almighty. Listen church. We don't trust God merely for what He can do for us. We trust God because of who He is. He is God. The true and living God. God did deliver Daniel because as it says there. Daniel trusted God. Did we read the whole thing? Well, let me read. <laughs> At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. And when he came near the den, he called Daniel in an anguished voice, a lamenting voice. Now, I could imagine how that voice sounded like. It's not like, Daniel, servant of the living. No. It's more like, Daniel, servant of the living God. Has your God, you know, that, that kind of lamenting voice. Has your God, whom you serve, continually serve, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. And they have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you. O king, the king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king's and at the king's command, the men who falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. It's, I mean, it's, it's like a movie. But God delivered Daniel because it says there, Daniel trusted in God. Listen, who, I don't know who I'm talking with to, but you can trust God to rescue you, to save you, and He will. Although sometimes God saves and delivers people not in the way they want to be rescued. Sometimes the Lord delivers His children or saves His people permanently by bringing them home with Him in heaven. And that is not a bad thing at all, is it? <laughs> And sometimes that is God's will. And that is the best thing that can ever happen to us. When God saves us and delivers us permanently. Not temporarily. We are made well and just to go again, live life and get sick again and go through that. And we know that God doesn't always heal people that way. We know that because there are many other individuals in the Bible that had faith, even bold faith, but died for their faith. They were martyred like Stephen in the book of Acts, the first Christian martyr. But because God wanted to use Daniel to declare to the king and to everyone that God is the true and living God, that God alone rules and reigns, and only God can truly rescue or save. And that's exactly what we read that the king does in making a decree and declaration. Declaration to the whole dominion of his kingdom from verses 
19 to 20, uh, verses 25 to 27, I'm sorry. And it says there, Then King Darius wrote to all peoples, nations, and men of every language throughout the land, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And that is why Daniel's faith was bold. Because he knew his God. God, the true and living God. And God lives. God rules. And God saves. Do you know your God? This is your God. If you believe in Jesus Christ. For Jesus, remember, was the one who died but rose from the dead. And he is alive and he lives forevermore. And he's now seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning as Lord, sovereign and supreme. And he alone saves, for he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Deliverer, the Savior. And there is salvation in no one else. And there is no, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. God lives, God rules, and God saves. Daniel lived this truth. So much so that it was a reality for him and, experienced, and he experienced it. Is this the reality in your life? It will be if you have faith in Christ, truly believe in Jesus as Lord in your heart. And when you do, you will distinguish yourself, live with integrity, moral excellency, Faithfully do what is good and stand for what is right. And listen, you will prosper in life. Because this, look at what happened to Daniel in the last verse. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Syria, Cyrus the Persian. When your faith is bold and live by it and demonstrate it, both in private and in public, you will prosper and be successful in life. So live for God. Live for Jesus. Stand up for Jesus. And you can if you have faith in Him. Do you? If not, why not? Is there anyone else that can save you? There is only one God. And there is only one way to God. And that is Jesus Christ the only begotten Son of God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Remember the Bible said that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So that he who has the Son has life, but he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. But as many as receive him, he gave them the power to be called the children of God. So that if you confess your, with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Will you believe in your heart and receive him in your life as your Lord and Savior? You can do that by faith in prayer. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you once again, for giving us your word that we desperately need, especially in a time such as this. Lord, you are raising for yourself your people, a people with faith, bold faith, that is genuine and real in a private and even in public. And so, Lord God, we thank you because even this faith is a gift from you. And Lord, thank you for the opportunity and the honor, even the joy of being used by you in this time, in this generation, to let the light of your word, the gospel message of Jesus Christ, to shine forth in and through us 
through our testimony and the words that we say and through the lives that we live in integrity and faithfulness to you and who you are. Even though there are challenges now that we face of being despised and rejected, mocked, even persecuted, and perhaps even being canceled. But let us not fear, for you are with us. And even though you may not rescue us in the way we want to be delivered, our faith in you stands firm. For you are the true and living God who rules and reigns, and indeed the God who saves. And if there's anyone among us and even those who are listening through live stream and face and, and the recorded message who have not truly given their faith to you, Lord, may your gospel message now touch their hearts. And whoever you are, I'm talking to you. The Lord loves you. He came to save you. Come to him by faith in prayer. And in humility, tell him and acknowledge to him that you're a sinner and you need him that you believe in Him, that you receive Him in your heart as your Lord and Savior. If you do that in your own words, the Lord will save you and you will be His child. Thank you once again, Father God, for the blessings of this morning, even the fellowship with one another as we continue to honor and worship you even now through our tithes and offering. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about